Hello, everybody, and welcome very much to our afternoon session with Connie Malamud. I'm really, really pleased to be chairing this session because visual design in all its forms is something that's really, really important to me. So some of you may know me through my virtual classroom work at Lightbulb Moment or through being deputy editor of Training Journal, both of which are very visually important elements and that runs throughout all of our learning experiences. So we're really pleased to have Connie Malamud with us. She's the e-learning coach. She's got a great website with loads of resources. She does podcasts with people as well, which you can learn loads from. And we're going to learn from her today all about visual design. It's a bit of a crash course for you. So over to Connie. Thank you. Can you hear my American accent well enough? <laughs> OK. Very well. Thank you. So I need to get to know who is here. Can you tell me how many of you are actually working in such a way that you are, need to do visual design? You're creating graphics. Let's see how many of you are creating materials. OK. Now how many people are supervising someone or managing someone who's doing visual design? OK. You're almost as important. And how many people are here who they don't even know why they're here? <laughs> OK, we have a few people. Sure, that's cool. You know, a lot of people think that they don't know much about visual design, because if you ended up studying instructional design or cognitive psychology or just got into the field, you think you may not know enough. But you actually do know something, and I'm going to prove it to you. But it will involve you politely shouting out. Here we go. <laughs> it's best to fill up a slide as much as possible. True or false? false. And they said the Brits won't yell out. <laughs> I knew they were wrong. You're all right. Use as many different fonts as you can. False. OK. Adult learners don't care whether a course is visually appealing. Oh. See? OK, you can leave. You know so much <laughs> about visual design. In the past eight or so years, I've written two books about visual design. So you can say I'm slightly obsessed with it. Now, I don't have a life. I have 100 books on visual design. I counted them in my shelf. and. A couple of the things that I'm so excited about and, and I'm just like endlessly fascinated about is how we perceive and process visual language. Visual language has become so important today. It's um, 50 years ago, it wasn't even as important, even just perhaps a decade ago. But with the internet and with apps, visual language is so important. And how it relates to cognitive psychology <coughs> is so important. And that was when I wrote the book, uh, Visual Language for Designers. And I never really meant to write that book. So years later, after I got over the pain of um, birthing a book, I wrote Visual Design Solutions. And that one is really for learning professionals. And I thought it would be cool, rather than having to go out and buy the book, I will pack everything that I can think of into one hour and make a crash course. And you are here for it. Now, a lot of people, not you, I'm sure, but a lot of people that you may work with don't really understand the value of visuals. So if you ever need to tell them what the value is, here are some of the reasons why our brains are so attuned to visuals. And that's because 50% of the brain's cortex is devoted to processing visual information. And the cortex is that gray covering, 50%. So for people who are sighted, we are processing visual information all the time. And in fact, at a very unconscious level, before we're even aware of it, we are scanning the visual environment, probably to make sure that we're safe. It could be a vestige of times past. There are more brain resources devoted to vision than to any other sense. And that is really amazing. And those are some of the reasons why if you feel attuned to visuals, your brain is very, very good at processing them. And perhaps that's why there is this phenomenon in psychology known as the picture superiority effect. 
And that basically said that we have a better memory for pictures than for words. So this diagram of the heart, if you were a medical student and you had to just learn the words and parts of the anatomy, it wouldn't make much sense to you. But by adding a visual, it helps you remember it. And of course, I am not against words. I use a lot of them. Pictures and words together work best. And one really fascinating thing to me about visuals versus words is that when we read, we read one word after the other in a serial manner. Yet when we perceive a visual, we perceive the whole thing at first. So it's like we're working in parallel, like our brain is doing parallel processing. We, we see the whole picture first, and then we look at the small components. So what does the research say? The research says that visuals capture attention. If you look at a newspaper, you may find yourself looking at the picture first. Well, probably you don't have newspapers anymore. But if you look at one online, you may find yourself looking at the visuals first. They capture attention. Visuals improve understanding, partially because of that picture superiority effect. And this is what we're talking about are relevant visuals, visuals that are going to enhance learning. And visuals aid recall, recall because they think that there are two channels, one for words or one for auditory information and one for visual information. So if you use a visual, you give a person another way to recall information. We also have an amazing memory for pictures. You may look through a picture album from decades ago and remember that you saw that picture before. Now there's this other fascinating research. This is wonderful. And it has to do with aesthetics and the effect that beauty has on people. Now, when we think about learning materials, we don't usually think of beauty, do we? But can anyone here kind of describe the aesthetic experience? When you see something beautiful, it could be architecture, it could be a landscape, it could be a painting, it can be a new baby. What do you feel inside? It's hard to put it into words when you see something beautiful. Anybody want to say? Bear their soul? Happiness. She feels happiness when she sees something beautiful. Anyone else? Gratitude. Gratitude. OK. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> Any, anyone else? Elation. Calm and? Elation. Elation. OK. So all of those things are what? They're all positive emotions. Well, aesthetic experiences cause positive emotions. and. There's some research that's beneficial to show that positive emotions are beneficial, are beneficial to learning, to problem solving, and to creativity because it kind of puts your mind in an open state. So this is another reason why any kind of learning materials we make should have some sense of being well designed so they can create an aesthetic experience and a motivating experience for the learner. I teach design workshops, and I will get people who say to me, you know, I'm not creative. I was never the creative one. Well, have you ever seen a child that wasn't creative? I mean, children are just so creative. So I believe that we still have that inside of us, even if you don't feel it now. And you know, it's a lot easier to become a designer than it is to become an artist. It's a lot easier to get good at design than it is to get good at art. And I'll tell you why, because they're really different. Design is always utilitarian. It has a purpose. And art is an end in itself. Design communicates a specific message. And art involves self-expression. Design starts with assets. You usually have uh, some ugly logo, a bad palette. Um, you usually have some photographs. But art often starts with a blank slate, a canvas, a lump of clay. And finally, 
Design is judged by its effectiveness. I don't care how wonderful the design is. If it doesn't meet the need, and if it doesn't fulfill its purpose and communicate the message, then it's not effective. And art is judged by beauty or by insight. So I'm going to prove to you by the end that you can get better at visual design. And if you're managing people, you can get better at recognizing and becoming more aware of what effective visual design is. And if you are here because you're not sure why, well, you'll probably get something out of it. So what is visual design? When you hear this simple explanation, it makes everything clear. Visual design is the arrangement of visuals and text in graphic space. Visual design is the organization of visuals and text in graphic space. You can do that. All you have to do is nicely arrange the visuals and the text in graphic space. And maybe know a few 20 or so other things. There's just, I read an article about a Dean V. Pond, who's a, a designer from the UK. And he was writing an article that said he was asked to come to a school and speak about a career in graphic design. And he was so excited. He was thinking he could tell the students how he had done jobs for all of these big international companies and the fantastic work that he had done. And then he found out that they wanted him to speak to kindergartners. And uh, the way he explained what design was to these kindergartners was brilliant, and I wanted to share it. Design is about making something easy to use or easy to understand. I use colors, letters, and pictures to help people understand things. Sometimes the simplest explanations are the best. So now I want to focus on seven ways to design with intention. And that's what it's all about. To me, designing with intention means that you're thinking about your goal and you're using visual language to communicate that goal or to help learners reach that goal. Maybe you want to reflect for a second on what designing with intention means for you. Designing with intention. It might mean something different to each person. And you know, it doesn't even matter. Once you learn the principles of visual design, and I'm sure you know, you're familiar with a few of them, it doesn't matter what you're designing. You could be designing a brochure to communicate or market a new training program. You could be designing an information graphic to teach people or explain something. You can be designing a job aid. You can be designing an app or e-learning. You can be designing a learning portal. It doesn't matter. The principles of visual design hold true everywhere in every, in every one of these types of materials. So the very first principle is align your design with whomever you are going to be, with all of your viewers, your participants, your delegates. And this is no different than what we do in instructional design. From a cognitive perspective, in this case, it's from a visual design perspective. So we always want to align our design with our audience. And we always want to align our visual design with the content. Are we teaching safety training um, to perhaps forklift operators? Or are we designing something that will be used as a script for call centers? And we also have to think about the visual repercussions of designing for a particular type of business or corporation or organization. Is it going to be for a hospital or is it going to be for a fast food chain? 
We don't have these in the U.S., and I'm a vegetarian, but I did hear that Nando's has great chicken. Is that true? Okay, huh? All right. <laughs> so you wouldn't be designing something, obviously. You wouldn't be giving it the same look and feel if you were designing for a hospital as if you were designing for a fast food chain. And here's, here are just a few examples I'm going to show you some ideas of what I'm talking about. This would be a title screen, let's say, for an e-learning course in leadership skills. And I would pick maybe something more muted and something more conservative. And the typeface or the font is going to be a little bit more formal. Now let's contrast this with a fictitious course on skateboard design for skateboard designers. Maybe it would be on a diagonal, which creates, uh, makes it more dynamic. I can't say that word. And the typeface would be wild and crazy, and it would try to appeal to people who are painting skateboards. That's, those are two extremes. And here's another one. What if I was designing for nutritionists, or designing to help encourage and persuade people to eat healthy? That design would look completely different, too. It would probably have a lot of green in it and big, bright pictures of food. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about aligning your design to the audience. Does anyone have any comments or questions about that? Wow, I must be really good. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Yeah. I do go through a process. I don't know if I would do one before the other. I might tend to go through the um, photograph or the visual first, but I don't think everyone would. I think it would be perfectly fine to go for the typeface or the font first, too. And in this case, I, was deci I decided I didn't want it to look very formal, but I didn't want it to look extremely casual either. And we are going to talk about fonts in this case. Um, so in this case, I happened to be going through a stock photo site and just saw a beautiful bright color, you know, bright colored image, and I used that, one that would make everyone in the audience hungry. And, and then I pulled out of that image the color for the typeface. Um, and then I put a border around it just because it seemed like, I don't know if that shows up very well here, just to, it kind of contained it and brought out the green just a little bit more. I think so much of design is playing, and once you do it a lot with intention, you get this sense of, that's not right, that's not right, let me try this, let me try this, that's right. So I think you really have to play and explore a lot. On the other hand, I know you have horrible deadlines half the time. So in those cases, you might just say, well, this is good enough, and this is what they're going to get. <laughs> so uh, somewhere between those two, because I also uh, am in the trenches making uh, learning materials for clients. So I know what it's like to have deadlines. But it's a great question. What's the process? Another principle is to organize and to think about graphic space. And to explain what graphic space is, start to think in terms of 3D space. Everyone is aware of 3D space. You walk into a room that's cluttered, and no, that is not my house. You walk into a room that's cluttered, and it makes you feel kind of bad. It creates negative emotions. There's just too much junk all over the place. It's like walking into a teenager's bedroom. So that gives you a certain feeling, that clutter of 3D space. And in this case, it gives you a feeling of calm, clean, uh, more positive emotions when things are less cluttered. Well, if we take the concept from 3D space to two dimensions, that's what graphic space is. And most people, when we look at a graphic or a picture, any kind of visual, we tend to separate it into foreground, well, that would be this way, and background. And often, 
we take the dark area and make that the background. So we've got foreground and background. Well, in graphic design and visual design terminology, the area that, has, that is the background, the area that is not occupied by text and visuals is considered white space. And white space does not need to be white. It just means the area that is not occupied by visuals or text. And one thing that amateurs or non-professional designers often do is not really think about the white space. But if you can flip your perception around and look at that white space as a shape, you can find out if it's pleasing. Just look at that for a minute and look at the shape of the white space. So you're changing your perception and you're thinking about space. And any time you design a slide or a job aid or whatever you work on, if you start, just make a little reminder, put a sticky note on your mo monitor. You know, if you begin to think about white space, it will start to happen naturally. You won't even have to remind yourself. And thinking about space is an important way to become better at visual design. Another aspect of space are the layout considerations. You can center everything. And when a, a layout is completely symmetrical, everything is pretty much a mirror image on either side of the axis. When things are centered or perfectly symmetrical, it's calming and it's comfortable and familiar. And I, Everyone uses this at times. You'll see a lot of book designs, book covers will use, will often use centering like that. But it is also a little bit less interesting to most people, and it's somewhat static. So let me show you an example of an asymmetric. And you can see that, well, I'll go back, on either side of the axis, nothing is a mirror image. When I take away those lines, you could say it's a little bit more interesting. Let's ask people. How many people think this is a little bit more interesting, this asymmetrical? OK. And how many people think the asymmetrical is more interesting? So it's somewhat subjective. It seems like almost everyone thinks the asymmetrical is more interesting. It's OK to use both. It's just a matter of designing with intention. Now, this asymmetrical image is actually balanced. Anybody want to want to say why? I think it's kind of obvious. You've got the text on one side balanced by the man on the other. So it's perfectly balanced. But you don't have to balance it. You can balance it if you want to. If you want to create a certain tension, if you want to create a certain kind of anxiety, which could happen in something you're doing, you can make it unbalanced. And that works too. It's just all a matter of designing with intention. You choose. One thing is there's really no right or wrong. That's good and bad. Sometimes we end up using lots of small little images, and that creates what designers call little rivers of white space. Between every small image is a little area of white space. And sometimes that doesn't look very unified. It looks like it's the space is broken up too much. And if you don't like that look, and also it seems to be a trend, of course, to be using giant images online, you can just take away the small ones and use one image. And here's a quick way to make a title screen or a quick slide. Throw in a shape. In this case, I took the color of the man's apron. Put in your title. Of course, nobody wants to work in the United States anymore. <laughs> This is an old, old, back when they did. And this isn't going to win an award, but it looks, it looks OK if you're trying to go for, hey, I need something quick. Try a triangle, try a rectangle, see what comes up. And then sometimes, for example, in e-learning, I want to make it look unified. So I'll take this title slide, and then the next slide, I'll use the same image for my question, for the opening. And there's this 
funny balance between making it unified, so unity, and then you want to make things varied too. So you need a little bit of both. You don't want to make it completely varied. Every single slide, you don't know what's going to happen. But you don't want to make, want to make every slide exactly the same. Anyone have a comment about graphic space? I'll give you a minute to think. OK. Let's talk about visual hierarchy. This is another insider tip. Graphic designers all know about visual hierarchy. And often, learning experience designers, instructional designers, L&D people don't. And it's so easy to learn, and it's just great. And by the way, the reason I like to call us visual designers rather than graphic designers is because graphic design as a career is often focused on advertising, posters, um, marketing. And our focus is usually on learning materials or information design. And although they overlap, they're kind of different. So visual design is something that we can own. So creating a visual hierarchy means the visual hierarchy controls the order in which the viewer sees all of the elements in your design. So you can actually control where people's eyes move. And that's really an amazing power, an amazing opportunity to improve your explanations or whatever your, your interactions. Now here's an example. You can just call out, what do you see when you look at this first? What's the very first thing that caught your eye? The phone, did anyone, was there anything else? The title? Is that what's going on? You what? What did you say? Oh, the graph, OK. Well, you were supposed to say phone. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, you can see whatever you want to see, and however you see is fine. But in this case, a lot of people will see the phone first because it's large. It's in the upper left. And it's unnecessary, because when we start to look at it, e-commerce is going mobile. So most people in this, who are at this conference, if not 100%, know what a mobile phone is. So we can take that out. So this is a visual hierarchy that's not intentional. And here's a, a way that I made it intentional. I put the title at the top because we read from left to right and top to bottom. So anything that we're going to put at the top or in the upper left is going to be seen first. I want people to see the title first. And then I want them to see the graph. So I'm, I'm thinking in terms of going down. I'm creating a visual hierarchy, and I'm trying to control your eyes. And I made the mobile part brighter because that's the point. And then there's a small explanation below. But I want people to know, what is this about? What's this graph about? And that's why it's at the top. So that's an example of controlling people's eyes, controlling the viewer's eyes through a visual hierarchy. And here's how you do that. First, you stop and think to yourself, what's most important? And I'm not saying you have to do this on, I know that some people make two hours of e-learning. It's sad, but it's true. You may not be able to do this on every single slide. Or you might be making a one-hour presentation. Or a website that has hundreds of pages, but you can at least get the idea, or you can make templates. You stop and think, what is most important on this slide? And then you can put the thing that's most important, that you, where you want people to look first at the top or in the upper left, because that's where the eye falls first. You can also make it larger, because people notice objects that are big. You can make it colorful, because people notice things that are bright. You can combine them, color and size. You can use a visual cue. You can use an arrow. I did an experiment once. I asked, I was kept checking in with a, th uh, a little kid. And by three years old, she knew what an arrow meant that an arrow meant to look. At three years old, she understood that visual language. Yes? I just wondered whether, when you're looking at it from a different, like, with a different language, whether they don't read in the same direction. Do you have to 
uh, the question is, what if people aren't reading from left to right? And I did some research on this, but I don't necessarily believe it. It said that people reading in any language, in any direction, still look in the upper left. That's kind of hard for me to believe, but maybe it's true. Um, I think maybe there's you know, more recent research, or I would tend to, if you're reading from top to bottom, I would tend to just use the top. And if you're reading from right to left, I would probably just um, ask some audience members where they look first, because I don't know about that research. It seems odd to me. Yes, whoops. Actually, I was going to ask the same question. If that is a brain process, you know, top, down, and left, around. Right. It is quite important. And really, you know, lots of times the only answer to a question is to speak to your participants, your audience, and find out what's really going on. I would trust that, their perceptions more than research. I mean, not that I don't trust a lot of the research, but that one just didn't quite make sense to me. Thanks for asking a good question. Also, when you number things, you almost can't stop your brain from wanting to go to a one first. I mean, if I see like a really bad diagram, I like look for the one, and then I start counting. So just real quickly, think to yourself, here's a decent diagram about the components of a diamond. Look at all of the techniques they used to create a visual hierarchy. They made something larger. They moved it to the top. They used numbers. They used a, a different colored font, so that's a little bit brighter. That's an example of using many, many techniques of a visual hierarchy. I'm letting people take their pictures. OK. And if, to establish a visual hierarchy, there are many ways. And I'd like to put this up there so you can get that picture. <laughs> These are the five ways we discussed. Does anybody have any questions about a visual hierarchy? For how many people is this a new concept? Hmm, not that many, just a few. Great. So we're going to do a little activity. You'll need a way to access the internet. I think you all have a mobile phone and a way to write down your ideas. Go to apple.com. Go to the Apple website, because they will often embody a lot of these principles. You need to talk to your seat neighbor, so you might need to move a little bit closer together. You have just about three or four minutes. And I want you to see what techniques Apple is using that aligns with their message how they use white space, whether they're using a symmetrical or asymmetrical layout, and how they use a visual hierarchy. You will be graded on this assignment. <laughs> I'll be sending the scores to your parents. OK, go. I can't wait to hear your brilliant insights. Would you say that the Apple site, and in this case, um, I, I want to hear from you, would you say that the Apple website aligns with Apple's message? How, how, why would you say that? We found ourselves using words to describe their website, which actually describe an Apple. Wow, that's insightful. So we were saying, it's really clean, it's fresh, there's lots of green, it's crisp. And I said, hold on, that's <laughs> That's great, wonderful. Anyone else? Uh, the reasons why you think it aligns with Apple's message? Yes. It's all very simple and content. Just a little bit of content. It's very simple and clean. And it's interesting that when something is expensive, as Apple computers are, they use a lot of white space, don't they? You can see that on luxury clothing sites and stores. It's kind of interesting. I don't know. What's that? Food on meals. Yes. The more expensive uh, meal, the bigger the plate and the smaller. 
and the smaller the serving. It's everywhere. Okay? How do you think that, how did you notice that Apple uses white space? Anyone? How did, what technique did they use for layout? And is it cluttered or, you know, is there a lot of white space? Anyone? Layout. Simple layout, right. Simple. Bold, bold images. Bold, bold images, clean backgrounds. Um, I'm looking at it on my phone. Let me see, I have a website picture of it here. Yeah, it's still pretty much the same. Lots of white space and symmetrical or asymmetrical? So there we go. Here's a good example of a symmetrical layout. Um, perfectly balanced, makes you feel calm. They did it with intention. Let's see what the next one is. Oh, we got to that. Okay, how did you think that Apple, the designer here, used a visual hierarchy? The images are bigger than the text, so you just want to, boy, I'd like to have that. Go ahead. No matter how much you scroll, you never get away from the Apple. Mmm. I see. No matter how much you scroll, you never get away from the Apple. Very good. That's great. Excellent insight. Well, I'm hoping that by the end of today, you'll be able to analyze everything you see when you're on... Um, the underground, when you see signs, when you are on websites, you'll be able to analyze it with some of these principles, and that will make you a better designer, because you will see ideas all the time. The other day, I was at the bank, and I recognized the stock photo and the poster that they had. Oh, I've used that woman 10 times. But anyway, they had this like kind of cool, curly shape, and I had been banging my head against the wall trying to come up with a good design, and that shape was perfect. As soon as I got home, I used that curvy, curly shape, and um, I had the solution to my problem. So you will find a lot of solutions by becoming more aware of design around you. Another facet of visual design is to consider all of your image options. You know, we frequently just think, oh, I have to use a photograph. But really, there is a continuum from high to low fidelity of images. And one is it's color images, realistic uh, graphics come first. That's the highest fidelity. And 3D, um, 3D renderings, realistic looking 3D renderings. Images that maybe have no color are a little bit, have a little bit less fidelity. Silhouettes have even less. Outlines have even less. So you can think of a continuum, and you can make your own kind of continuum. There's all kinds of images you can put in. You could uh, put an illustration in there in between the silhouette and the black and white. But anyway, there are all kinds of images that we can use that we may not be thinking about. So for example, people generally go towards color photos. And this is a picture I took of you at that meeting last week. Yeah, I know it was a tough one. You can use black and white photos. Sometimes I just use black and white just to make it look a little more artistic, to make it a little more subtle, to make it a little bit different. Using black and white photos is great when you're talking about things that happened in the past or legacy software, and then bam, color for what we've got today. You can use illustrations, and if you don't have an illustrator, most people don't have one. In addition to uh, buying stock illustrations, you can go to some of those websites and hire a contract illustrator, and I've done that, and it's been very reasonable and a good experience. You just look at their portfolio first. Two places where you can find them are upwork.com, U-P-W-O-R-K, dribble with three Bs, um, Behance.net. These are all places where illustrators um, will have their portfolios and will work on a contract basis. You can use silhouettes. And a lot of times I use silhouettes when I don't really want the graphics to be at the top of the visual hierarchy, but I do want to subtly suggest what I'm talking about. I'm guessing a lot of people may use icons, or a lot of, anyone here in love with icons? Yes, they're great. 
You can use colored icons. You can use black icons. You can also use symbols to get your point and get your message across. You can use diagrams and charts. So these are, you have a lot of image options. Don't always go right for the photograph. You've got dingbats. Did anyone ever try to use them? This is what you do when you're on a very low budget. <laughs> dingbats are a typeface, and there are many of them. Wingdings, they come with every computer. You can download many types for free. And instead of having a character or a letter or, or punctuation, there's a little illustration. You take that illustration, which you actually type out, you know, in the wing ding font or whatever your ding bat font is, and you make it perhaps as large as 150 or 200 point. And it becomes a really big illustration. So this was the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E. So I took the E, which was a desert, and I made it maybe 200 points. Put a, put a sky behind it, uh, more desert, put a title, and there we go. This is your super low budget option, but I meet people regularly who say, my boss won't give me any money for graphics, or we just don't have any money. So dingbats are there for those people. Um, let me see, does anyone have any questions about uh, just types of images that you can choose. One thing that the research does show, and Ruth Clark has a good book about this, that relevant graphics improve learning, but irrelevant graphics, graphics just thrown up there to decorate, often distract from the message. So you have to you know, there's this fine line between eye candy and relevance. You want it to be motivational and look nice, which is why I'll often use silhouettes. But yet you don't want to distract people with something that's completely irrelevant. So there's this really fine line that we have to walk as visual designers. Now, at, this, at the start, we talked about um, use every font you can. And everyone you know, laughed about it. So fonts are a really big issue in our field. A lot of people, you know, you can get a master's degree, a graduate degree in typography. It's very deep typography. So let's talk a little bit about it. Typography is just designing with words and letters. That's all it is, designing with words and letters. And nowadays that there are so many digital fonts, people use the terms type, typeface and font interchangeably. They did a study on non-designers that showed that people unconsciously, without even being super aware of it, can tell when there is a mismatch between a font and its subject. People can tell what personality a font has. So I want to see if you're all normal. Would you say this font is elegant or casual? Elegant. Say you're normal. Would you say this font is sophisticated or informal? So fonts have personalities, and we can tell. How about this one, old-fashioned or modern? A little bit of both, huh? Well, you know what's kind of interesting? I mean, I think of it as a modern font, but if you start to go back and look at the history of some of the fonts, they're often a digital version of something that was designed 150 and two years ago, uh, 200 years ago. So anyone who said it was old fashioned, you might be right. For all I know, this was made that long ago. It was a trick question. There are many, many categories of fonts, but if you just think about these three, you will be well on your way to being a good visual designer. There's the sans serif. There's the serif font with the little feet on the letters, and the sans serif does not have the feet, and script. Most people say, but not everyone agrees, that you want to use sans serif fonts on digital devices. And that's because the resolution is often not quite high enough to be able to make out what the little serifs are, so it just kind of looks a little bit junky. Most people agree, and this is user interface research, 
that a serif font is best for print. And if you look at most books in your house, you will find a serif, they are printed in a serif font. So most people think that that's true, and they have done some research on it. And it may be because the little feet bring your eye along. A script font is fine to use once in a while, but it's difficult to use. You would never want to make an entire paragraph, you know, sentence after sentence after sentence in a script font. But a lot of times you probably use it on like a little sticky note or to look like something's handwritten. That's what they're for. The easiest way to make your typeface, to make your visual designs look good, is to just use one font that has a lot of styles. And here's what I mean. Look at Gil Sands. Roman is regular. It's got a bold. It's got an italic. It's got a light. I don't know if you would ever need a light, because that might be hard for people who are visually impaired. But frequently, when you stop and think about it, you may not need more than that. And if you pick just one font, you can't go wrong, because a lot of people don't, aren't really sure how to, how to combine fonts. This is one of my favorites, Roboto, and I downloaded it from Google Fonts, and they have a huge number of fonts for free. And what I like about the Roboto font is that it not only has Roman and bold, but it has black, which is even darker than bold and thicker. And the condensed font, I love to have something with a condensed font because those letters are tall and narrow. So they're designed exactly the same way, but they're more narrow. So when you're trying to fit some, uh, something like um, labeling and information graphic, or in this case, the slide deck is made from the Roboto font, and there were some places where I just couldn't fit something in at a large enough font for you to see it in the audience. So I used something that was condensed. So if you choose one typeface, that has a lot of styles, everything you'll need, then you can't go wrong. But if you're a real rebel and you have to use two, here's how to do it. You choose from two different categories that have similarities. And the whole reason for doing that is about, is kind of like, um, did you ever put on a black top and a black bottom? OK, women, anyway, a lot of guys don't care about this. And the blacks look weird to each other. Maybe the guys care, I don't know. My husband doesn't. And the blacks don't go. They kind of clash, but they don't look right. Well, that's what happens if you use two fonts that are really close to each other, but they don't quite look different, but they don't quite look the same. It's just a little bit odd. So you use fonts from different categories. And here's what I mean. You might use a serif font for the title and a sans serif for the body text. However, how do you know which ones to pick? First of all, there's millions of designers who have blogs who, will, who put out these font combinations. And you can see if you like what they've selected. But the other thing is, there's a little trick here. You try to pick two different typefaces that have some kind of similarity. And in this case, notice the O. The letter O is somewhat narrow. It's not super round. So I'm, I found similarities between this font. I think it's Garamond and I can't remember, maybe Roboto. But you look for f two different categories that have some similarities. And that's how you pick two fonts, if you want them to look in harmony with each other. Now, will anyone notice this? They may not, but on an unconscious level, it may look um, dissonant. So that's why designers go to those kinds of extremes. It's a, it's a neurosis, yes. OK, now here's something. I know you don't do this, but I bet anything you've seen people at work who do this. They put text on backgrounds with a big color gradient from dark to light. And when you get to the bottom, you can't even read it. So the solution is a narrow color gradient. And here's something that I know you don't do, but your friends do. They put text right over the, a photograph, and you can't read it. I see this on websites all the time, and I just wonder, what are they thinking? This is a, a stock photo about virtual reality. It's an odd photo, I agree. But anyway, so you can, I wonder if that's projecting well enough. I hope you can see that. You can put a solid color text box behind, uh, behind the text. Or what I like to do is something like a 12% transparency. Can you see through that box out there in audience land? Okay. 
by making it slightly transparent, but you're still able to read it, it looks unified. It doesn't look like the text is separate from the photograph. So it looks like it's all one thing together, but yet you can read the text. So those are some ways that you can deal with text on backgrounds. Does anyone have any other tricks that they use? OK. I just wanted to learn something while I was here. This is an all-time favorite. I can't say it's a visual design principle that you'll find in most books. But it's something that our field desperately needs. There's nothing wrong with bullet points. There's nothing wrong. They line up nicely, and they make things easy to read. But what happens is when you've got one slide after another, after another, after another, you know, it gets really boring. People need a little bit of change. So here are some ways to quickly transform bullet points to visuals. Joe, did you bring any sound effects? Because a drum roll would be so good here. All right. Thank you. Some of these are taken from my book. If you have my book, uh, excuse me. I've taken some of the visuals from it. Here's a list of bullet points. The easiest, quickest thing you can do is just put it in a shape. And I think, I haven't seen research on this, but I believe that your learners will be more likely to read what is in the shapes than a list of bullet points because they're so bored from bullet points. They've seen them so often. And since this is about happiness, maybe you can even make your own shape and make it a little bit wild and crazy and draw something different. OK, here's another way to, ch to change bullets into visuals. Construction work guidelines. So one thing you can do is make a text box with an icon on it. That's simple, but yet it looks a lot nicer than the bullet points. Every icon is essentially a bullet point. And here's another way you could design that. One more. You can make people speak the bullet points. You might have to change the wording around a little bit, but you can make people speak them. That's another way. And in this case, bullet points are of design considerations. You can turn it into a diagram with the main point in the center and arrows going out to each point. OK, that's all the ideas I have. <laughs> One other thing that will really help you is using subtractive design. You're going to love this if you haven't read about it already somewhere. And maybe you've probably, you might have figured this out on your own. Someone hands you a slide or uh, some work or they leave and you have to take over someone's job and you look at it and you go, oh no. And you start pulling things out. And that's what subtractive design is. It's removing the unnecessary elements up to the point where the design breaks. Now if you're happy with your design, you don't need this. But if you're not sure and you're going, oh, I'm not sure about this, I don't really like this, but I don't know what's wrong, try subtractive design. You just pull things out up to the point where you no longer will communicate your message. So here's an example. I was working on some slides uh, for a doctor. And she was writing about uh, physician burnout. One thing I don't understand is why don't people notice when graphics are squished together? I see that online all the time. And I go, is it me or is it them? I'm pretty sure it's them. So anyway, this was the um, slide deck. And I want to show how I use subtractive design to fix it up. First of all, we really don't need a logo on every screen. Anything that is extraneous information distracts from what you want to, people to look at. It's part of the visual hierarchy, and people will look. And I just always think, well, if you have a logo on the first screen, 
and a logo at the end, do you really need it on every single slide? And if it's for internal training, I think that people know where they work. So we don't need it for that. Um, you probably don't need the date. Nobody cares. Uh, the title, yes, you might want to have the title. You might want to let people know how much more they have to suffer through, so one out of 10. I understand that. But there, there's often a lot of extraneous information you can just get rid of. So let's get rid of that. Bam. OK. Now, I found that hospital waiting room distracting, and it doesn't do any good. So let's get rid of that. Oh, it's already starting to look a little bit better. Now, in this case, this is for slides. So I pulled out one point per slide. If this were e-learning, it may not be that way. We may not want to design it that way, because people don't like just clicking next, next, next. But since this was for a talk she was giving, I pulled out the first point and gave it more impact. 50% of physicians report at least one symptom of burnout. The guy is still squished, though, and I feel so bad for him. I've got to unsquish him. He's so much happier. All right, so now we've got a decent photograph. We've got um, a large number so people can see that's the point. And we've got one fact, one statistic there. I want to make it stand out a little bit, so I pushed him to the side, highlighted it, and that's an example of subtractive design. Now, true, I did add that band behind the text for contrast. But that's an example of how you can use subtractive design. Get rid of everything that is not necessary up to the point where the design will break. And then don't let your design break. Breaking the design would have meant I took away the fact, the main statistic. That would have broken the design. So I want to show you. I want to do one more activity with you, because you know how learning is. Unless you do something, you don't really learn. So I'm going to show you a really ridiculously bad slide. And with your neighbor, just a couple minutes, discuss how to improve this slide. I know. Think about the visuals, the typography, the bullets, and the clutter. You've just got a couple minutes. Talk. OK. Do you know how much fun it is to make bad slides? It's really fun. You should try it someday. What about the visuals? What would you do to fix the visuals? What's that? Get rid of them? Is that what they said? OK. We'll get, I, I don't have an example of getting rid of them, but yeah. OK, we'll imagine it. How about the typography? Is that OK? No. What's wrong with the typography, someone? Alignments all over the place. The alignments all over the place. So some things are centered, some are left justified. Anything else? There are two titles. There are two titles. Good point. <laughs> They're too similar, OK? <clears throat> What's that? No There's no hierarchy. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. The background? Yeah, noisy background, right. OK, what about the bullets? Would you leave the bullets, or would you do something with them? What's that? We, we definitely do something with them. We'll either put them into some sort of graphical form, or we were just saying as well that the, the, some of the bullets are so big that maybe they warrant a slide all by themselves. Mm, so she was saying they might, they, they might put them into some graphical form, the bullets, or some of them are so big, maybe perhaps they should be on a slide by themselves. Good points. Isn't it fun to do this? What else? Yeah. I think I would leave the first bullet point set aside time to read and respond to even as the title. Mm. Oh, that's so interesting. I like that idea. She would take set aside time to read and respond to email as the title, and then use a visual that shows how to do the other things with like little arrows to it. Or, yeah, great idea. Well, it's just about time to wrap up. I would love to destroy this slide even more. But I know what you're thinking. How can I improve? Here's my advice. 
Raise your awareness of design around you. Everything that you see that's made by a human has been designed. It was an idea in someone's mind. So look around for great ideas. They're all around you. Magazines, labels, um, websites, signs, advertisements, things that you would throw out. First look at them and see if there are any good ideas when they come in the mail. Learn the principles. You've already learned several of them today. And then practice like crazy. And I really like to tell people this, and this is very important. Don't compare your work with professional designers who do this 40 or 50 hours a week. Compare your work a few months from now with how you designed a few months ago, and you'll see how much you've improved. Just keep practicing and designing with intention. And you know what? If you want to break the rules, you can. I saw a great design recently that used every single font. You know, she must have used 12 different fonts, and it was so well done. So once you have a sense of things, if you want to break the rules and you're doing it with intention, you have a reason to do it and break them. Thank you so much.